I call Ms. Sarah Britt, B R I double T. Ms. Britt. Now, Ms. Britt, would you prefer to take an oath or to make an affirmation? An affirmation. Affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Miss Britt. Yes, Mr. Hollow. Uh, your full name is Sarah Caroline Britt. Correct. And you're head of advice compliance at AMP. Correct. Your business address is 33 Alfred Street, Sydney. Correct. Um, you have received a summons, Ms Britt, from the Royal Commission to give evidence? Correct. And do you have that summons with you in the box? Yes, I do. I attended the summons. Exhibit 2.160, summons to Ms Britt. Um, Ms Britt, you've prepared a statement in, in response to some questions asked by the Commission. Yes, I have. Um, and you prepared a statement under rubric 2.27, uh, 2 dated 10 April uh, 2018. Correct. And you have that statement with you? Yes, I do. Um, do you wish to make a clarification in relation to your statement? Yes, I do. Um, does the clarification concern the timing of the rev revocation of authorisations of one of the advisers who, are the, uh, who is the subject of your statement? Correct. Could you please go to paragraph 34D on page 10 of your statement, Ms Britt? Yes. You there refer to a letter of 23 June 2016 sent by uh, Charter to Ms Coleman termin terminating her agreement and authorisations on 90 days notice. Correct. Can you tell the Commissioner please when Ms Coleman's authorisations were uh, revoked? Uh, yes, um, Ms Coleman's... Um corporate authorisation was in fact revoked on the 23rd of June uh, 2016. Her personal authorisation was revoked uh, on 90 days, so that was on the 30th of September 2016. How did you uh, become aware of those matters? Uh, subsequent uh, to finalising my statement and submitting my statement, I um, I actually undertook an ASIC search and had a look at the ASIC register and, and realised at that point that actually the, the, that the date um, for um, revoking the corporate authorisation was earlier. Thank you. Um, having addressing, addressed the timing of the revocations of those authorities, are you satisfied that the contents of your statement are true and correct? Yes, I am. Uh, I tender the statement of the exhibit. Witness statement of Ms. Britt concerning rubric 2-27, 10 April 18, is exhibit 2.161. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Um, Ms. Britt, in your position as Head of Compliance at AMP, you're responsible for the advice compliance team? Correct. And one of the responsibilities of that team is to escalate and make reports of issues and incidents to the breach committee? Correct. Uh, and immediately before your current role, you were the team leader, senior legal counsel, litigation and dispute resolution at AMP. Correct. Correct. And you've worked in the financial services industry since 2004? Correct. And you've been put forward by AMP to give evidence about advice given by three financial advisers? Correct. And the first of those, uh, the name of that advisor has been anonymised in your statement and I'm going to refer to him as Mr E. Uh, the second is Ms Jennifer Coleman, who you've just referred to? Correct. And the third is Mr Andrew Palmer? Correct. And each of those uh, people was an authorised representative of a subsidiary of AMP at the time they provided financial advice? That's correct. And AMP operates its financial advice business through several entities, including AMP Financial Planning uh, and Charter Financial Planning? Correct. Uh, Charter Financial Planning has its own financial services licence? Yes, it does. 
and AMP also previously had a subsidiary called Genesis Wealth Advisors, is That's that correct. right? That's correct, yes. Uh, it too had its own financial services licence. Yes. And it's now ceased operation. Yes, I think I think the the AFSL still exists, but we, there's no it, there's no active advisors within Genesis. I'm just not sure whether we've actually wound up the um, AFSL yet. And why are there no active advisors within Genesis? Well, the intention is that that Genesis will cease. I'm, I'm just not sure that that's actually happened yet. It's quite a can be quite a protracted process. And why is the intention that Genesis will cease? Um, I, I'm not actually aware what, what the decision was around that. I, I just know that we no longer have active advisors in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And the great majority of financial advisors uh, authorised by an AMP licensee are not employed by an AMP entity, are that's, they? That's correct. And about 90% operators authorise representatives of that's an correct. AMP licensee? Correct. Now, the first advisor that you deal with in your statement is the person I said I would refer to as Mr E. Yes. Uh, Mr E became an authorised representative of AMP Financial Planning in December 2015. Correct. And he was an employed financial planner of a firm that was also authorised as a representative of AMP? Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, your witness statement deals with two clients of Mr E, a married couple, who were given inappropriate advice by Mr E in November 2016, approximately a year after he commenced as an authorised representative of AMP Financial Planning. Correct. Uh, can I take you to first to the statement of advice provided by Mr E to those clients on the 17th of November 2016? Uh, which is at tab three of your statement, AMP 6000-0037-1463. Yes, I have that document. Uh, now, could I ask that you turn to 1466? And we see there what Mr E has recorded as what the clients told him they wanted to achieve. Do you see that at the top of the page? Yes, I do. Uh, and although the names of the clients have been redacted, we can see that the husband and wife are recorded as wanting to make sure that their funds are performing better to meet their goal of accumulating more wealth in the long term. Yes. And. I, I think you have a copy that is unredacted, is that right, Ms Britt? That's correct. Yes, you can see that the second uh, um, goal that's listed there relates to the husband. Yes. Uh, you want to make sure that you are adequately insured to protect you and your family during misfortunes. Yes. And further down the page, we see that Mr E has recorded in particular, after discussing your preferences and goals, we interpret your advice needs to be in the following areas. Reviewing and rolling over your existing super fund to another super fund and putting in place a binding death benefit nomination on your recommended super fund. Yes. We then turn to 1469, where we see a summary of the advice given by Mr E. Yes. And you can see that uh, the strategy one uh, relates to the husband. Yes. And we see that the summary of the advice given to the husband is that he roll over and consolidate his superannuation benefits from two existing funds, TAL Super and MLC Master Key Superannuation, into one fund, which is My North Super. Yes. Is TAL Super owned by AMP? No. And MLC is a NAB subsidiary? Yes. Uh, so the recommendation was that the husband roll over the $68,000 he had in TAL Super and the $73,000 he had in MLC Super and put both of those, a balance of $125,000 into My North Super. 
Yes. Uh, who's the product manufacturer of My North Super? Well, it's an, it's an AMP product. Thank you. And you can see that the second strategy, strategy two, related to the wife? Yes. And the wife had her superannuation in Vision Super, Vision Super Saver? Yes. Is that owned by AMP? No. And the recommendation to her was to roll over the $46,000 she had in that super fund also into My North Super, the AMP product. Yes, that's right. So the recommendation was to move from three funds, none of which were owned by AMP, into one fund which was owned by AMP. Correct. And we can see in the box that relates to the husband's TAL super balance, uh, the reference deduct the exit fee of $16,189.05. Yes. And the balance, as I've said, was approximately $68,000 in that account. Yes. So the advice to the husband from Mr E was to sacrifice close to 25% of the balance of the fund so it could be transferred to My North Super. Yes. And would you agree that unless the TAL funds returns had been or were likely to remain very significantly lower than the likely My North Super returns, it could not have been in this client's interest to lose a quarter of their superannuation fund? Yes, that's right. So unless there were significant benefits which would outweigh the exit fee, um, then yes, correct. And were there significant benefits that outweighed the exit fee? Well, so based on the documents I've seen, reviewing and reviewing the SOA, um, I couldn't identify what those benefits were. Mm -hmm. and, and I think similarly the, uh, the auditor who conducted an audit of the SOA uh, similarly was, was concerned that, that if there were such benefits, it, it hadn't been demonstrated what mm. they were. So there was no evidence on the client's file to demonstrate any benefits to them that outweighed the loss of the $16,000 exit fee? Uh, not, not that I have seen. There, there, there is uh, somewhere in the statement of advice a fairly general comment around that the expectation <laughs> was that that uh, on retirement the My North Super um, balance would be higher, but, but certainly I haven't seen anything to demonstrate that in the SOA. And if we move further into the advice at page 1474, we see Mr E's comments about this recommendation. Uh, and can I direct your attention down the bottom of the page to the trade-offs of our recommendations? Yes. You need to take into consideration the following trade-offs when considering our advice. And there's a reference to the husband. In your case specifically, rolling over your existing TAL super will incur $16,000 of exit fees since you haven't met their certain conditions which will decrease your superannuation benefits. However, your super benefits will be invested in Zenith model portfolio inside My North Super, which will provide you better performance so that you could earn more. Yes, I see that. And there's no attempt to compare the likely returns from remaining in the current funds with the likely returns from moving to My North Super? No, there isn't. And there's no recommendation of any superannuation fund other than My North Super? No, there isn't. There is, however, consideration of one other possible superannuation fund at 1506. And you see there the reference to an alternative strategy. I'm sorry. Yes, one, I do. I'm, I'm sorry. You, you have the hard copy page, but we have the incorrect page on the screen. We need 1506. There we go. Alternative strategy. Uh, you could roll over your superannuation benefits into another product, AMP Flexible Super. Yes. And consider other insurance policy one path. And then four reasons are given for not recommending that strategy. Do you see yes. that? Yes, I do. 
one path is more expensive. That's the insurance policy, is that right? Correct. Uh, secondly, My North Super has more investment options, 364 portfolios than AMP Flexible Super. Yes. So that's an explanation of investment options between the products, but for an investor with a superannuation balance of about $125,000 uh, or about $46,000, which was what the wife had, is the number of investment portfolios available through a fund a sufficient reason to switch? No, there, no, there was nothing to indicate that that would have been a sufficient reason. Mm -hmm. And the third reason is that My North Super offers the ability to invest in listed shares, term deposits, specialised investments, etc., uh, whereas AMP Flexible Super does not. Again, that would be an insufficient reason to warrant switching? Yes, unless they were listed as specific goals of this client, which they weren't, then that would not be a sufficient reason. Uh, so, Ms Britt, this was inappropriate advice provided by Mr E? Ye yes. Yes, based on, well, based on what I've seen, I'm only looking at the SOA. I haven't seen, I haven't reviewed the whole file and looked at the fact find. But based on what we see in this SOA, yes, it appears that it would be um, inappropriate advice. Why haven't you looked at the whole file, Ms Britt? You were asked questions about uh, this advisor and these clients. Did you restrict your consideration to certain documents on the file? Well, my, my team's role is not to, we don't review the whole file, we rely on um, audit, the audit function, they review the file. We rely on uh, the findings of that audit report. So I'm confident that the relevant auditor has looked at, at the entire file. My team won't have a copy of that and we don't review that. Mm -hmm. But AMP has put you forward, not an auditor, uh, to explain the conduct of this advisor? Yes, and my response is based on what I'm seeing in this SOA and based on the auditor's report that I would agree it appears to be inappropriate advice. Mm -hmm. um, it was inappropriate advice that resulted in financial detriment to the clients, wasn't it, Ms Britt? That appears to be the case. And uh, the husband incurred an immediate loss of almost a quarter of his superannuation fund as a result of the implementation of this advice. Yes, he has incurred that exit fee, yes. Uh, Mr E was first audited by AMP. I believe that. Do we know the comparative uh, uh, performances of uh, TAL and uh, the My North funds in the succeeding periods? So, Commissioner, I personally have not, have not seen that, but when, when AMP looks to remediate these customers, that, that is the process they will undertake. They will construct the counterfactual looking at what the comparative performance would have been. You said, Ms Britt, when AMP looks to remediate these customers, and I want to come in a bit of detail to remediation shortly, um, but this advice was given in November 2016. ANZ has not remediated... AMP. I'm sorry, AMP has not remediated these clients? No, we have not yet. So I'll, cut, I'll return to that. Um, but first, um, I was asking you about uh, Mr E's auditing. He was first audited by AMP in September 2016, which was about two months before this advice was given. Correct. Uh, and if we um, look at AMP 6000-0043-2829, we'll see the results of that audit. I'm sorry, is there, is there a tab number? No, you have not annexed this document to your statement, Ms Thank Britt. You. It's on the screen now. And you see there that the audit that was conducted two months prior to these clients receiving this advice resulted in a C rating? Yes, I can see that. And that meant that Mr E had met 
all of the major quality advice principles, but specific areas for improvement were identified? That's right. Uh, and this audit, have you seen this document before, Ms Britt? Yes, I have. And so you know then that the audit identified a number of medium weighted issues as well as a high rated issue? Yes. And the high rated issue related to concerns about whether there was compliance with the best interest duty in recommending a rollover of superannuation funds to another client? Yes. Uh, and we see from this document that based on these audit results, a decision was made to audit Mr E again six months later in March 2017. Correct. And that was because he got the C rating, which resulted in an audit being scheduled six months later. Correct. I tender that document, Commissioner. Policy review and statement of actions dated 22 September 16 AMP 6000 00432829 is exhibit 2.162. And Mr E was audited again in March 2017? Correct. And a number of his files were selected for review, including the file of the two clients that I've referred to? Yes. Uh, and you've annexed the audit report for that audit to your statement. It's tab 2, AMP 6000 00280440. Yes. <coughs> have that document on the screen now, Ms Britt, and we see that the result of the audit of Mr E in March 2017 was that he was given an E rating, yes, which meant that he had failed to meet the minimum standards required when providing advice. Correct. Was this the worst available rating in an audit? Yes, that's right. And. Uh, You've read this document? Yes, I have. You know that there were eight high-weighted issues identified as a result of this audit, as well as 11 medium-rated issues? Yes, that's right. And can I take you to the part of this audit report that concerns the super switching advice that was given to the two clients we've discussed? That's at 0446. Yes. So you see there that the um, person conducting the audit has recorded that when replacing existing products there is a need to demonstrate that there is a clear net benefit to the client from making the switch. Yes. And there is a reference two paragraphs down to the $16,000 exit fee incurred by the husband. Yes. Uh, and um, also for the wife in the final paragraph on the page, the auditor detected that she was going to be charged a higher ongoing fee as a result of her rollover? Yes. And over the page at 0447, we see the auditor's conclusion that it's insufficient to use more investment options as a basis for rollover without adequately considering investment options available the, in the existing products. The yes. client file did not contain confirmation of the clients being willing to pay the additional cost for increased investment options. Yes. Now this wasn't the only file audited in this audit. No. And it wasn't the only file audited in this audit that demonstrated inappropriate advice? No. It wasn't even the only file of Mr E's audited in this audit that demonstrated inappropriate advice in connection with switching the client to another high cost product? The, uh, no, it wasn't. And it wasn't even the only file in this audit that demonstrated inappropriate advice to a client from switching from an existing superannuation fund into the My North superannuation fund despite an exit fee being incurred. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this audit, there were remedial actions that were required of Mr E? Correct. And Mr E failed to comply with those remedial actions? Um, yes, I think that's right. And he was issued with a show cause notice? Um, he would have been issued with a show cause notice regardless of whether he completed the remedial action because having received an E rating, um, the automatic consequence of that is that we issue a show cause. Thank you. And the matter was also escalated to advice governance, is that right? Uh, correct. So advice governance, we now call advice compliance. It's the same team. I see. It's my team. So what is or was advice governance? Why would this have been escalated to them? So um, we have a um, consequence management framework which says that once a, um, an advisor receives an E rating in an audit, then they are immediately referred to the what is now the advice compliance team for my team to apply the relevant consequence. So for an E rating, um, the advisor will immediately be issued a show cause letter, effectively asking them to uh, demonstrate why they shouldn't be terminated. And the matter was then brought to the attention of the AMP issues panel, is that right? Correct. Uh, and that panel met on the 28th of June, uh, chaired by you? Correct. And at that meeting of the issues panel, the issues panel decided not to terminate Mr E. That's right. Um, but instead to put him on conditions that he wasn't to service any clients uh, until mandatory vetting and para planning measures were taken. Um, no, I don't think that's quite correct. He, he was not to, you're you right that he wasn't to provide any advice. Um, we did put mandatory vetting and power planning in place, mm -hmm. but it, it was pending the outcome of a broader review of files okay. through the um, re remediation team, it, which is, it's called sampling. It's, it's um, having a, a, a look at a broader cross-section of files. Mm -hmm. And until that process had been completed, he was not to provide advice. That's right. That right. That's right. Uh, can I take you to the materials that were considered at that meeting of the issues panel, which are at tab 12 of your statement, uh, AMP 6000005973. Yes. Just wait until we have those on the screen, Ms Britt. Yes. Uh, so these are the materials for the meeting of the AMP issues panel on the 28th of June 2017. Yes. Could I ask you to look at 6007, which is the start of an issue assessment document in relation to Mr E? Yes. There we have it. Yes. And then I want to turn to a page within that issue assessment document, which is 6009. Yes. And we see there the recommendation made by advice governance to the issues panel. Yes. It is advice governance's recommendation that the advisor's personal authorisation be revoked and the agreement with AMP financial planning be terminated with immediate effect 
the panel should consider whether the advisor's conduct amounts to a serious compliance concern and warrants reporting to the regulator. The panel should consider whether the matter warrants referral to the licensee incident panel for the purposes of conducting a licensee breach assessment. Then we see in response to that, the stakeholder view. The licensee does not support the recommendation by advice governance to terminate the advisor. Yes. What were the licensee's reasons for not supporting that recommendation? So I think um, there were several factors that they asked us to take into account. One was that the response to the show cause letter had been provided by the um, practice principal of, of the advisor's practice. He was an employed advisor within that practice. Um, that practice principal had offered to put in place um, certain things to, um, in relation to, to um, additional sort of supervision of that advisor. Um, and so there were discussions around whether or not there were there was additional training and controls that could be put in place such that this advisor um, could be kept on. He was um, relatively new and relatively junior and there was discussion around um, whether in fact with additional training and supervision that um, he would in fact be able to improve such that um, we would be comfortable to keep him on. Um, at that time, the, we had requested a further file review from the, remedi from the remediation team. So um, the suggestion was pending the outcome of that review that the advisor be left in place, but with those restrictions we talked about. Was that the right decision in your view, Ms Britt? Um, so there was certainly some discomfort around that decision. Um, we do have fairly, some fairly robust conversations at these, these panels and it is a balance with um, the risk to the clients, the risk to the licensees um, versus what kind of controls can be put in place. and and whether the issues are such that we think that there, there, there will be um, tangible improvement with, with training and, um, and additional supervision. Um, in this case, as I said, there was a level of discomfort, but um, the decision was, given that we had already requested this additional file review take place, that that would better inform us as to whether or not we wanted to keep him on. So a scoping report was produced from that Correct. sampling process, is that Correct. right? And that resulted from a review of 20 of Mr E's files? That's right. And eight of those files were deemed to contain inappropriate advice? That's right. Uh, and the scoping report contained a recommendation that all of Mr E's client files be reviewed for his 67 clients? That's right. Uh, and. The report revealed a new piece of information uh, in respect of the advice given to the clients that um, I asked you questions about earlier. Um, Mr E had cancelled the husband's insurance uh, before new policies were entered into. That's right. The result being that he was uninsured for a period of three months. That's correct. And AMP was then told at the end of August that Mr E's employer had decided to terminate him. <coughs> Correct. Uh, and can I take you to the communication from Mr E's employer, which is at tab 15 of your statement, AMP 6000443914. Yes. And if we could have 3914 and 3915 on the screen at the same time, We'll see the entirety of the email, <coughs> which was sent on the 31st of August 2017 um, to a representative of AMP. And do you see there that the employer told AMP, um, as per today's call and our recent discussions over the last two weeks, we have internally and independently come to the view that we will be terminating the <coughs> advisor, as we believe he represents a heightened risk to our business 
which is beyond our or his ability to remedy and that he is unable to provide our clients management or the licensee with sufficient confidence that he can perform the tasks required by his role as an authorised representative. Yes, I see that. So the employer formed the view that Mr E needed to be terminated. Yes. Did AMP, after receiving this piece of information, um, terminate Mr E as its authorised representative? Well, he had, at that stage, he had already been terminated as, a, um, as an AR of Oak Financial, so we would then need to revoke, revoke his um, personal AR. And did you? Uh, I believe we did. Well, there was another meeting of the issues panel, the AMP issues panel on the 25th of September, which you again chaired. Yes. And can I take you to the minutes of that meeting, which is at tab 16 of your statement, AMP 6000005855. Yes. I could I ask you to look at 8567? Yes. Again, an, another issue assessment document in relation to this particular advisor. Yes. Uh, and if you turn to 8569. Yes. We see again um, the recommendation of advice governance. Uh, Number three, advice compliance recommendation. Yes. Based on the evidence gathered, it is advice governance's recommendation that the panel should consider whether the advisor's conduct amounts to a serious compliance concern and warrants reporting to the regulator. Yes. The panel should consider whether the matter warrants referral to the licensee incident panel for the purposes of conducting a licensee breach assessment. Yes. Uh, now, Um, Mr E's conduct was not regarded by AMP to be a reportable breach under section 912D of the Corporations Act? Well, it was his conduct was determined to be a serious compliance concern yes. and he was reported to ASIC as a serious compliance concern. Um, we then separately look at whether or not there has been a licensee breach. Yes. And the decision was in this case that there hadn't been a separate reportable licensee breach in relation to the advisor's conduct. And this is despite the fact that this document shows that the issues panel identified under the heading relevant considerations and over the page, a large number of provisions of the Corporations Act that may have been breached by Mr E? That, that's correct, but the fact that the advisor may have breached obligations under the Corporations Act doesn't necessarily follow that that's a licensee breach. Was there consideration uh, of whether this was a significant breach that needed to be reported under Section 912D? Yes, so every time we terminate an advisor, we consider both is is that advisor an SCC that needs to be reported? And is there anything to indicate that separately there was a licensee breach? Um, and, and we obtain legal advice at the time to inform us and the panel then makes a separate decision on the licensee position. In your statement, you give an explanation of why Mr E provided inappropriate advice. Yes. You blame him and his employer. Uh, yes. You blame him on the basis that he was a relatively new financial advisor who had a lack of experience and a lack of competency. Yes, that's right. And you blame his employer for failing to adequately supervise and coach him. Yes. Does AMP accept any responsibility for the provision of inappropriate advice by Mr E, its authorised representative? Well, we, we would say, and the investigations we undertake at the time, we look at 
Um, was there any breakdown in our monitoring and supervision? Um, did, did our controls and processes work? So this was an advisor who was picked up on audit. Um, he was, as a new advisor, subject to mandatory vetting for a time. Um, he, he was someone that we then referred to our sampling team to have a, a broader look at files. Um, so in that, in that sense, we would say that we've discharged our obligation, our monitoring and supervision obligations with respect to, to this advisor. Do you maintain that, Ms Britt, in circumstances where AMP picked up on an audit two months prior to the advice provided to the two clients I've referred to, two months prior to that advice it was picked up in audit that Mr E was delivering inappropriate advice of precisely the same sort of um, advice that he gave those two clients? I'm sorry, I lost the thread of what the question was. And, and that, that's my fault. The chronology is that two months prior to the advice being given, correct. that I've spent some time yes, discussing yes. with you, there was an audit. Yes, correct. And that audit revealed deficiencies in Mr E's provision of advice of the same style as the deficiencies that pervaded the advice given to the two clients? It, 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 the audit, he received a C rating on that audit mm -hmm. and based on the fact mm -hmm. that it was a C rating, there are um, some uh, additional training, controls, remedial, remedial action, which will arise out of an audit like that, but it was, he had received a C rating, and a C rating is considered to be a pass. And my, my point to you is that the remedial action that resulted from that yes. did not prevent him from providing inappropriate advice to these two clients. Well, that appears to be the case, given that he did go on and receive an E rating and and provide this advice. So do you maintain that there was no failing in AMP's systems and processes? So we we would maintain that we we have a robust system of detecting and if necessary terminating advisors who are providing deficient advice. Mm -hmm. And that system um, operated in this case, we see, so that detection of inappropriate advice by Mr E did not prevent him from continuing to provide in advice, inappropriate advice to clients thereafter. So, yeah, yes, that's the case here. And do you maintain that there are no inadequacies or deficiencies in your systems and processes when that can occur? So I, I don't think AMP's position is ever that there are no inadequacies in our systems and processes. We, we would accept that um, it's constantly subject to, to scrutiny and to improvement. And um, we have a number of, of programs at the moment that are looking at this very thing, including our audit function, including our training of advisors, including our policies around best interest duty, insurance advice. So my position isn't that our system is beyond reproach. Um, we, we are constantly looking to improve it. And, and when there are circumstances like this, we do reflect on, as part of our breach assessment, we reflect on were there, are there any improvements that could be made in the system to try to prevent this type of thing happening in the future. And you made no changes to your practices or procedures as a result of Mr E's conduct? Not that I'm aware, not directly as a result of Mr E's conduct. Uh, Notwithstanding that AMP has been aware since March 2017 that Mr E provided inappropriate advice to the clients we discussed earlier, causing them financial detriment, AMP hasn't contacted those clients? No, I don't believe they have. I don't believe we have. AMP <coughs> hasn't offered any compensation to them for the inappropriate advice that they received? Um, 
Not to date, no. Why not? Um, the, the the clients of, of Mr E and indeed Mr E's entire book has been moved into our remediation program um, and we will now need to do a file review of every single file of Mr E's to ascertain whether there was inappropriate advice and if there was inappropriate advice, we then need to go through the exercise of ascertaining whether or not that inappropriate advice has resulted in financial loss to, to the client. So the scoping report that was produced in August 2017 recommended that all of Mr E's client files be reviewed? Correct. Did that happen? That will now happen as a result of the book being placed into remediation. What, why has it not happened, given that that was determined to be a necessary step in August of last year? So th that is a function of um, the this, this size and scale of our remediation program. So we have a, a standalone BAU stream who looks at um, the books of terminated advisers and Mr E's book will be part of that pool of files that the remediation team will be looking at. So the size and scale of your remediation program at AMP is such um, that you cannot dedicate resources to remediating clients whose detriment has been apparent to AMP since March of last year? I don't, I don't think it's so much that we can't dedicate resources to it. It's that um, there are a number of advisors that are in that remediation program and that um, certainly the, the, his clients will be looked at and, and the customers will be remediated if they've suffered financial loss, but unfortunately they, they um, have that hasn't financial. happened yet. They that have hasn't suffered financial yet. loss, haven't they? Well, that that is a process that we need to go through. So no, I want we to need to we need to look at the file in its totality. We speak with the clients and obtain client testimony, and we construct a counterfactual to see where the client is today versus where they would have been. And so, yes, on, on the face of it, it appears these clients will have suffered financial loss from the exit fee, and, and they'll be compensated. Um, but until we've gone through that process, we, ca we can't know what that amount will be. Well, Ms Britt, with respect, you haven't started that process. These two clients don't know that they've received inappropriate advice because AMP has not told them. That's correct. That's correct. And, and, and it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. How that is the position. How many advisers are subject to your remediation program? I'm afraid I don't, I don't have that number. Remediation doesn't actually report into me, so I don't have that number. I do know that we have completed the remediation of 14 advisor books. I'm not sure how many more are still in the pool. <coughs> Excuse me. Have any of Mr E's other clients been contacted about inappropriate advice provided by Mr E? Not as far as I'm aware. The, the, the process is that, that we will look at the entire book together and, and write out to all clients at the same time. AMP's got an advice remediation compensation policy, don't they? We do, yes. And you've annexed a version of that policy to your statement at tab 41, which is AMP 6000047070. Yes. We see from 0072, Ms Britt, that you signed off on this document. <coughs> yes. Uh, and if we turn to 0073, We see that at the top, 
ANP has developed the Advice Remediation Program to enable fair and transparent remediation to clients who have been identified as potentially affected by non-compliant advice. The role of the Advice Remediation Program is to develop and manage an approach that will inform the client of any poten potential impact and seek to engage the client to participate in the review of their circumstances. Correct. The Advice Remediation Program does not apply to client claims or <coughs> complaints and is strictly limited to financial advice remediation within scope of the Advice Remediation Program. Yes. Uh, and if we look at the guiding principles for your client remediation program in the bottom part of the page, we can see that the remediation principles include restoring the client's position, yes. a client-centric approach, yes. timeliness, yes. and transparency. Yes. Have these principles been complied with in the case of Mr E's clients? No I, no, I don't think we can argue that we've been timely, given we still haven't contacted them. And these matters are not just the subject of internal AMP policies, they're the subject of ASIC regulatory guidance, aren't they? Correct. Are you familiar with ASIC Regulatory Guide 256, Ms Britt? Yes. Uh, which relates to client review and remediation conducted by advice licensees? Yes. That document is RCD 0021-0002-7080. And if we could go to 7121. You see there at paragraph 256.169 that the regulatory guidance from ASIC is that it is important that you proactively contact clients who have potentially been affected by the misconduct or other compliance failure. You should consider the appropriate way to do this, taking into account the nature of your client base, the methods of communication available to your clients and any preferences previously expressed by your clients. Does yes, a I see that. Does AMP consider it important to proactively contact clients who've received inappropriate advice? So AM AMP does consider that to be important. The consideration is that where we are not in a position yet to review that client's file, we, we, we don't contact them to alarm them when we're not in a position to review their files. So we contact them when um, essentially we have the resources to consider that particular book, we will contact the clients at that point because that is when we're engaging them to say, we are actively looking at your advice now and we'll be contacting you to talk to you about the review we're doing to, to obtain their testimony and then to reach conclusions. Are you saying that AMP is not in a position to consider the client file of the two clients I've asked you to give evidence about? Um, so obviously we could consider these clients in isolation of Mr E's book of clients. Um, we're not in a position to look at Mr E's entire book of clients currently, which is why we haven't, in isolation, looked to contact and is that these two. I just want to make sure I understand this. Is that because you have too many other advisers who have provided inappropriate advice that you are dealing with ahead of Mr E? Well, it's for, it's for a number of reasons. We've, we have not scaled up our remediation program as quickly as we should have. Why not? I think... Well, I think as a whole, the industry got caught by surprise by the, the scale and complexity of some of these remediation issues. We have a um, essentially a self-employed network, and it is a network of advisors, and it is an extremely time-consuming process, and, and, 
and time intensive process to go through and review each and every one of these files, to speak to every single customer, to construct the relevant counterfactual, um, and, and even by nature of the fact that it is a self-employed network, that there are documentation issues with trying to reconstruct client files to understand exactly what, what happened. And so it, it, it is a, a, an extremely time-consuming process. And, and we, as an organisation, I think underestimated just how big that task was. And as a result, we're just not as far forward as we should be. And, and, and we accept that as an organisation, it is one of our key strategic priorities for the advice business this year is to is to um, to stand up a, a a more efficient remediation program, and we've done a lot to resource it up, to restructure it, to um, um, a, 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 we're looking at um, and have begun a lot of outsourcing to third party providers. So it you know, we we have to accept that we shouldn't be where we are. It isn't acceptable that these clients still haven't been looked at, still haven't been contacted. We accept that, and that is why it is one of our strategic priorities this year, to make sure that that gets fixed going forward. When will these clients be contacted? Um, I, I can't, I can't, I can't categorically say when that might happen. Um, as I said, we would be in a position to remediate these clients in isolation, but we want to look at Mr E's entire book at the same time. But you don't know when they will be told that they were provided with inappropriate advice by Mr E? I, I can't say that. I tend or to there's a, a matter that uh, has been drawn to my attention that I need to deal with promptly. Uh, it is that uh, the name of the entity, I think, for which Mr E worked uh, was mentioned in the course of evidence. Uh, we have I've made a non-publication direction about the name of Mr E and a non-publication direction about the entity for which he worked because, of course, the two clients whose case uh, we have been considering uh, are unaware uh, of uh, these circumstances and uh, uh, I did not think it right that they should... Uh, learn of these things or deduce these things uh, as a result of uh, evidence being led in the Commission. Uh, the name of the entity for which Mr E works uh, will be redacted from the transcript. It is subject to a non-publication uh, direction. Uh, I simply draw it to the attention of the media in case they were uh, interested in uh, uh, or even perhaps contemplating publishing the name of that entity, uh, there is a direction. That's why the direction uh, is in place and it's why we have been referring rather elliptically to Mr E. Uh, so uh, Ms Orr uh, was anxious to uh, deal with that before we rose. But Thank should you, we say, uh, could, could I tender the last document and... Uh, if I could recall what it was, is it this was RCD ASIC regulatory guide 0021 0002 7080 ASIC regulatory guide RG256 becomes exhibit 2.163, I think. Yes. What shall we say? Uh, 2 pm. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms Britt, the second advisor that you deal with in your statement is Ms Jennifer Coleman. Yes. And Ms Coleman, through her corporate entity, became an authorised representative of Charter Financial Planning in October 2009. Yes, that's right. Uh, and Ms Coleman had entered into a representative services agreement with Charter in August 2009. Yes, that's right. Again, through her corporate entity. Yes. And could I ask you just to look at that document? 
which is AMP 6000-0052-1731. It's not annexed to your statement. It will come up on the screen. Yes. Um, and if we turn to 1734, we see that the parties are Charter Planning Limited and Jennifer Coleman Proprietary Limited, trading as Symbian Financial Services. Yes. And at 1757, uh, we see that the representative for the purposes of this agreement is Jennifer Coleman, the individual. Yes. And at 1735, I could ask you to look at clause 1.4. Yes. Ms Coleman agreed through her corporate entity by clause 1.4 to attain annual minimum sales targets uh, of $100,000 of new annual risk premium sales. Yes, I see that. And at 1736, we see that her remuneration was calculated in clause 2.1 in accordance with terms and conditions advised by the relevant product manufacturer. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, representative Services Agreement, Charter Planning Limited and Coleman AMP 6000-0052-1731 will be Exhibit 2.164. We've seen from that document, Ms Britt, that uh, Ms Coleman agreed to bring in $100,000 annually of new risk premium sales. That's insurance, is that right? Yes. And Ms Coleman was predominantly uh, an insurance-only advisor? That's correct. And in your statement, you provide details of insurance advice given by Ms Coleman to a de facto cu couple in 2016? Yes. Could I take you to the statement of advice for that advice, which is your tab five, AMP 6000-0037-0118. Yes. This is the uh, statement. It's an insurance plan. If we turn to, and you'll see it's a statement, styled as a statement of advice as well, towards the bottom of the page. Yes. If we turn to 0119, we see that Ms Coleman has had a meeting with this couple and when they met, the couple told her that they were organising a review meeting to bring her up to date with the changes in their life. Yes. And the um, female partner was enjoying her role as a full-time mother. Yes. And you can see, uh, although it's redacted um, in the version of the document that's in the online system, you can see it 0121, <coughs> the date of birth of the child of this couple. And you can see that the child was about one year old. Yes. And this, it seems, was the change in the life of this couple that they were discussing with Ms Coleman. Yes, it appears so. Uh, and then if we return to 0119, we see about a third of the way down the page, with these goals in mind, we went through a process of discussions, education, challenges and prioritisation to arrive at your final goals. And I should have taken you to the dot point above that, which was that they had told Ms Coleman that they wanted to make sure their family was secure should anything unplanned happen to either of us. Yes. Um, and the outcome of the discussions is summarised by Ms Coleman as follows. You would like to make sure you have adequate levels of insurance cover now you have a new daughter, as you want to ensure your family is supported financially if either of you were to suffer an unfortunate event. As a result, we will review your current insurance needs and ensure you have appropriate levels of cover through a competitive insurance provider. Yes. And then at 0121, the page I took you to earlier with the date of birth of the child, 
there's some information about the two clients there, which is redacted out of the personal details box, but you have that information in front of you. Yes. We can see that the clients were a young couple, the male was a tradesperson. Yes. And the female had listed her occupation as home duties. Yes. And you can see that the combined net income of the couple, oh, I see that has not been redacted out, is $73,000 towards the bottom of the page. Yes, I can see that. And at 0133, um, we come to the recommendations and there is a recommendation next to super ownership on the left hand side. Do you see uh, that? Yes, sorry, yes, I can see that. We recommend your life TPD and income protection insurance be owned by the trustee of the AIA Master Trust and paid for with annual rollovers. Yes. And in the table of the, at the foot of the page, we can see Ms Coleman's advice in respect of the male client. Yes. We'll just wait for that table to come up onto the screen. Um, Ms Coleman recommended that the male client replace each of his existing insurances, but with policies with the same level of cover? Well, it's actually, this table is, can be somewhat confusing. Um, what has actually happened is earlier in the document, the advisor has set out current level of cover. Yes. With, um, with TAL. The, what this table is purporting to do is to say, if you had the level of cover that I am now recommending, column one, this is what it would cost if you were with TAL. Column two, this is what it would cost if you um, adopted my recommendation to go to AIA. And we can see that the recommended insurance is said to be cheaper by just under $1,000 per annum. That's correct. Now someone in the position of these clients presented with this sort of advice would be entitled to feel comfortable that they'd made the right decision by seeking advice because it appears that they're saving $1,000 in their insurance premiums. Correct. On the face of it, yes, that appears to be what it's saying. But it was inappropriate advice, wasn't it, Ms Britt? It... Potentially, yes. Well, AMP knows that there were deficiencies in this advice, doesn't it? There are deficiencies in the advice document, absolutely, and those deficiencies were picked up on audit. Um, the, the, fa the fact that there were deficiencies with the way the advice was presented doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion the advice itself was inappropriate. Why is that? I'm not talking about client detriment necessarily here. I'm talking about the appropriateness of the advice. The advice can still be appropriate, um, it, it, even if, for example, um, a client, one of the things that, that might get picked up in audit is that they haven't, the, the advisor, sorry, has not, um, for example, followed the replacement of product guidelines and policy. So they may not have set out the table correctly, but that doesn't necessarily mean the advice itself was inappropriate. But the premiums for each of these policies were in fact higher than what was recorded here, weren't they? I'm sorry, which, which policies are you talking about? Are you talking about the existing insurance side or the recommended insurance no, side? No, I'm talking about the recommended insurance. Yes, so, so I th yes, my understanding is what had happened is that she's misquoted the insurance policies. Yes, so the clients were misled about the amount of money that they would have to pay in premiums if they replaced their existing insurance policies with the recommended new insurance policies. Yeah, that appears to be the case. Yes, thank you. And that's inappropriate advice, isn't it, Ms Britt? Well, I think what she's done is just got it wrong. Why, why are you resisting my characterisation of this as inappropriate advice when the clients have been misled into thinking that the premiums of the new insurance policies were lower than they actually were? I accept that the clients have been misled. I accept that. Thank you. Um, 
AMP knows about the deficiencies in this advice because a few months after it was given, uh, there was an audit of Ms Coleman's files, including this file. That's right? Correct. Correct. Uh, and Ms Coleman received a D rating, which that's, meant that she'd, that's failed, she'd failed to meet the minimum standards required in providing advice. That's correct. Uh, you've annexed the audit report to your statement at tab four. It's AMP 6000028 0686. Yes. You've read through that audit report, Ms. Yes, Wood, I have. Yes, I and have. And you know that the audit identified five high rated issues and ten medium rated issues across the files that were audited? Yes, that's correct. And if we turn to the review of the file for the two clients we've just been discussing, we see that that commences at 0690. Yes. And across the following pages, we see that the auditor discovered that Ms Coleman had misled the clients about the cost of the insurance premiums under the new policies. Yes. And these premiums were going to be paid out of the client's superannuation funds, correct. weren't they? Yes, that's correct. So they may not have learnt that the premiums they were paying were higher than they had been told by the advisor because the premiums were coming straight out of their superannuation funds. Um, potentially, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this audit picked up numerous errors by Ms Coleman across both this file and a number of other files? It did, yes. And just in relation to this file, for this couple, uh, the auditor found that Ms Coleman had also failed to disclose the exit fees that applied to the client's superannuation funds? Yes, that's correct. Uh, she'd failed to disclose that she might receive an activation payment in respect of one of the products that she recommended. Correct. Uh, she'd failed to document the scope of the advice. Correct. She'd failed to document the client's needs and circumstances. Correct. And that meant that she couldn't demonstrate that the advice was in the best interests of the client. That's correct, yes. The audit showed, didn't it, that Ms Coleman had provided inappropriate advice in respect of another two customers? I believe that's correct, yes. And this wasn't Ms Coleman's first D rating in an audit, was it? No, it wasn't. This was her third consecutive D rating. That's correct. Uh, and Ms Coleman had been told before this audit that if she received a third D rating, her authorisations would be revoked. That's correct, yes. Uh, and in June, following this third D audit result, the AMP Issues Panel decided to revoke Ms Coleman's authorisations? That's correct, yes. And uh, you um, referred in your um, evidence earlier to a correction about the date on which yes. those authorisations were terminated. <coughs> the, the corporate authority um, was terminated first in June 2016. That's correct, yes. And then um, Ms Coleman resigned as an authorised representative of Charter in July 2016. I would just have to check that date, but yes, she did. She did resign. Yes, it's in paragraph thirty-four, subparagraph E of your statement. Thank you. Yes, I see that. Yes, she resigned in July two thousand and sixteen. And she told Charter that by September she would have sold her business to another financial advice entity. Correct. Yes. Uh, and Charter revoked Ms Coleman's personal authority on the 30th of September 2016. That's yes. Uh, in your statement, you give an explanation of why Ms Coleman provided inappropriate advice. Yes. And you say that Ms Coleman was heavily reliant on support staff for undertaking a number of tasks. Yes. That she failed to take overall accountability for processes and procedures. Yes. And that she failed to take seriously the gravity of having two and then three D audit ratings. Yes, that's correct. So I want to ask you again, as I did with Mr E, whether AMP takes any responsibility for the provision of inappropriate advice um, by Ms Coleman, its authorised representative, in circumstances where it permitted Ms Coleman to continue providing financial advice following multiple failed audits? 
Well, again, um, I would respond to that by saying that we had a system of monitoring and supervision in place. This advisor and, and, and the advice was picked up on audit. Um, we did put both remedial actions in place and, um, and, and very targeted coaching. Um, so, uh, as well as um, following the second D, she was placed back onto um, mandatory vetting um, as a as a control over that advice. Um, uh, my own feeling, looking at at this advisor in in totality, and looking at when one looks at all the audit, audits lined up against each other. Um, it is, a, it is a concern. There was a pattern of conduct and, um, and, and ultimately it, it is apparent that, that uh, she wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't capable of providing um, good quality advice. Um, but AMP had the appropriate systems and processes in place to, de to detect her and ultimately to terminate her. Well, AMP detected her inappropriate advice, but then permitted her to continue providing inappropriate advice. Well, we permitted her to continue providing advice, and as I said, put controls in place. And it was it was, um, you know, obviously I wasn't in in my role at that time, but it was obviously felt that those controls were were going to be appropriate to mitigate that risk. Ultimately, when they weren't. Um, AMP acted to terminate her. Neither AMP nor Charter has changed any of its practices or procedures as a result of the misconduct by Ms Coleman? So I can't, I can't point to anything specifically that AMP has done off the back of this particular case. But as I mentioned earlier, um, there are a lot of, of improvements that, that AMP is putting in place, um, uh, revising its audit and vetting um, being one of them. And, and, and obviously a matter like this would inform those kind of programs, but I can't point to anything specifically that AMP has done off the back of, of Ms Coleman's case. You say in your statement that on the 6th of July 2016, the matter of Ms Coleman uh, was passed to the AMP Advice and Remediation Program for review? Yes. So that was nearly two years ago? Yes. Uh, has any compensation been paid uh, to the clients I referred to? No, it hasn't. Uh, have those clients been contacted about the provision of inappropriate advice by Ms Coleman? Not, not as far as I'm aware, no. So again, they don't know that the advice that they received from Ms Coleman was inappropriate? Not as far as I'm aware, no. And if the insurance policies that were taken out were renewable annually, a renewal period would have passed by now? If they are renewable annu annually, yes, that's correct. That would be correct. And if they are renewal renewable annually, which insurance policies generally are, um, the clients have missed an opportunity to elect not to renew those insurance policies. If, if that is the way that these policies worked, then yes, I would agree potentially, and that would be something that would be taken into account when any financial compensation is worked out. Isn't it better to take it into account now, Ms Britt, and to arm these clients with information about the inappropriate advice that they received so that they can make decisions about whether or not to renew these policies now? Well, yes, I'd have to agree. Ideally, yes, we would be compensating these clients now. Well, you say you're going to be compensating them, but I just want you to consider my question about whether a better way of doing this is to arm them with the information they need now uh, to make decisions about whether or not to renew these insurance policies. Yes, I would respond as, as I did with the other clients, which is that we look at the pool of clients as a whole when we are able to remediate that entire book. Mm. 
So I, I don't think you've answered my question though, Ms Britt, about whether it would be better for AMP to do this differently by telling these clients now so that they can arm themselves with the information they need to make decisions not to renew the insurance policies. <coughs> Yes, potentially, yes. I would agree. Why potentially, Ms Britt? Because I don't I, I don't accept the the I don't accept that these are actually being renewed annually, in which case so I would I would need to understand more about the facts. So <laughs> I am agreeing with you that yes, if they are policies that are renewed annually, mm -hmm. then yes. Okay. Um, did the AMP review and remediation program decide to review Ms Coleman's files? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Did the program to which Ms Coleman's matter was referred, um, was there a decision made to review the files of Ms Coleman? Well, so if, if the issues panel determines that the remediation program should review them, then they will review them. And have they reviewed them? Not as yet, as far as I'm aware. So the issues panel um, referred it to the advice and remediation program in July 2016. Have any right. of Ms Coleman's files been reviewed to date? No, they have not. Why not? Um, the, the, sa the, same, the same reason that that, um, that due to the size and scale of the program, we have not, this, these files have not yet been reviewed, but um, that we are currently um, resourcing the remediation program so that um, this can be exp expedited. I'll, I'll just give you an opportunity to consider that answer again, Ms Britt, because in paragraph 72 of your statement, you refer to 15 files having been reviewed. I apologise. I, I, um, I did specifically ask that question of the remediation team this morning and received a different answer. Um, I see. So this, this is incorrect. Uh, paragraph 72 is incorrect. Has been a review of 15 of those files? No. The, the inquiries we undertook at the time that, that I did my statement, if, that's, if that is what they indicated, then that is what is correct. I'm sorry, so the so information I would, you received this morning is not correct? That would seem to be the case. The information in your statement is correct, which is that 15 files have been reviewed? That is correct. And it is it therefore also correct, as you say in that paragraph of your statement, that conduct similar to Ms Coleman's conduct in relation to the two clients I've drawn your attention to was identified in eight of those 15 files? Yes, that's correct. And you estimate in your statement that the process of review in relation to Ms Coleman's files may require up to 100 of Ms Coleman's clients to be remediated. That, that is the estimate we have at this stage, yes. But no one has been remediated to date? No. Has any provision been made for the remediation of those clients? No, no as, as far as I'm aware, no. No specific provision has been made in relation to Ms Coleman or her clients. Are any of those clients uh, parties to ongoing service arrangements? I, I can't answer that question without undertaking further inquiries. Sorry, Commissioner. Because if they were subject to ongoing service arrangements, it would be uh, uh, interesting to observe uh, what the consequence of the provision of those annual reviews was. If, if they were subject to ongoing service arrangements, those uh, the arrangements would have ceased at the time of, um, of her termination. Yes. In your opinion, Ms Britt, has AMP allocated adequate resources to its review and remediation program? I think um, going forward, yes. I think historically we have under we underestimated the task ahead of us, and I think as an organisation we have to we have to own that. Um, 
and there has been um, a, a huge effort to restructure and reset the program going forward so that it is, <coughs> excuse me, so that it is adequately resourced and that includes, I think, a concession that we will need to um, be retaining third parties to assist us going forward. Has that happened? Has AMP retained third parties to assist? Yes, we have. And will yes. you retain further third party assistance? We Well, we have retained a third party and, and with the flex to expand or contract according to the need. And when did that happen? Um, so I'm aware that started to happen at the end of last year um, and that it's a process that um, has been ongoing and I know has been the subject of many discussions at DLT and, and board level. Ms Britt, I want to turn to the third. Before you do, Ms Orr, the two uh, cases we've looked at uh, so far uh, were found on audit, is that right? That's correct, yes. Uh, in the first case, one of the audits uh, gave a compliance rating of C, is correct. that right? Yes, that's correct. I think I'm right in recalling that you said that that was a pass? Yes, that's correct. Uh, was uh, one of the deficiencies identified in that uh, audit, the audit resulting in a, uh, a rating of C, uh, a deficiency that constituted a failure uh, to be able to at least demonstrate compliance with the best interests duty? My my recollection of the the first audit, the C audit, was that there was a best interest duty issue um, that would ordinarily attract a high weighting under our audit standards, but there is a materiality provision, and it appears that the auditor has exercised. Um, his or hers, I can't remember, um, discretion and, and formed a view that while it is high weighted, it was not material based on, the, on, on an assessment that it would not have impacted the advice. And on that basis, it wasn't scored as a high weighted issue. It was the more general question that uh, seems to me possibly to emerge from what you've said uh, is what uh, significance uh, AMP gives to compliance with the best interests duty uh, in its audit process. Uh, it's a very generalised question, so uh, can I pose it at that level and ask you uh, what response you would make to it? So a, generally a failure on audit, picked up on audit, to comply with the best interest, du interest duty would attract a high weighting. So AMP does consider that to be a high weighted, meaning high risk, issue and it would be scored accordingly when when working out what rating would be allocated to that particular advisor but the bare fact that it is accorded a high rating is not in and of itself sufficient to consider uh, the future uh, engagement of the representative. The, so receiving a high, high, a high weighted issue will go to the rating and, and that rating is what we use to consider the future of that representative. Yes. Yes. Perhaps it's of assistant just, assistance just in relation to those questions to bring back up AMP 6000432829, which is the audit you've been speaking of, Ms Britt. Yes. And bring up page 2834.
which is where we see the high rating that was accorded to the best interest duty component of this audit. Yes. So this failure was accorded a high rating. Correct. But your evidence is that the auditor regarded it as not being a material high rated issue. That's correct. If it, if it, if it was considered to be material, you would see next to the heading best interest duty, it would have the word scoring impact in brackets afterwards. The fact that it doesn't <coughs> indicates that the auditor in this case has made a decision that while it is a high-weighted issue, it's not material. And that was the reason the C rating was given, because if it was a material high rating, a C result could not have been attained? Um, yes, I believe that's right. I believe once you have a high-weighted issue, it tips it over to a D-weighted... A, a D rating, sorry. Thank you. So... What is the auditor entitled to um, consider in exercising their discretion as to whether or not to rate a high rated issue material or not material? So there are guidelines set out in the audit standard. I have to say that I personally struggled to reconcile when I looked at this audit, yes. the decision that it was not a material issue but all I can say is that, that that is what the auditor decided at the time and that, that is how it ended up a, a C rating. I can't, I can't necessarily justify that, that decision. Yes. Well, lest there be any doubt about it then, Ms Britt, does that... Uh, give some cause for concern about the efficacy of the audit process? If you're not able to explain how it is that this was not high rated. So, Commissioner, yes, um, look, I, I think we are currently, as I mentioned, revisiting large parts of the audit process. Um, so we accept that um, there are always improvements that could be made in that regard. Um, I would say in relation to this particular case that if, if it had have been scored, this advisor would have received a D, the result of that would have been to bring forward his next audit. Instead of six months' time, it would have been three months' time. But it would not in any event have resulted in, in his termination. What it would have done is brought forward the next audit. Um, but in terms of your overall question, Yes, that, that is one of the issues that we're looking at in terms of the e efficacy of our, of our audit process. Thank and you. we're doing a lot of work around that as a result of Report 515. Yes, thank you. Ms Brute, I want to turn to the third advisor that you deal with in your statement. That's Mr Adam Palmer. Yes. He became an authorised representative of Genesis Wealth Advisors in 2013. Yes. And Mr Palmer was interviewed by Genesis with a view to becoming an authorised representative in 2012. Um, Perhaps I can show you a document yes, to sorry. assist you Could in you answering that yes. question, Ms Thank Root, you. Uh, which is AMP 6000-0053-0051. Have you seen this document before, Ms Britt? Yes, I'm sorry, yes, I think I have, yes. It, it's a form completed by a, a Genesis employee. We see his name at the bottom, Mr yes. Peter Hillis. Yes. And it seems to have been completed based on an interview by Mr Hillis of Mr Palmer. Is that right? Yes. Do you see the reference to the I, I have interviewed the I advisor? Do, yes. yes, I do. And uh, we see at the top, if we could pan back out to the top of the page, that this is a questionnaire that forms part of the FAN. Do you, what is FAN? Um, I believe FAN is Financial Advice Network. The Financial Advice Network due diligence assessment of potential new advisors. It must be completed for all new recruits. Yes. 
and the advice assessment comprises four parts. Um, practice procedures, yes. which relates to completing parts of this document, an advisor assessment, which again relates to completing part of this document, yes. an advice profile, and a client files review. Yes. And there are also reference checks with the previous licensee. Yes. Now, um, in this document at 0052, we see that Mr Palmer told Genesis that he was coming from another licensee, and that licensee was Australian Financial Services. Yes. Did you hear any of the evidence last week about Australian Financial Services, Ms Britt? I'm afraid I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to put to you is that at this time, in 2013, it was well known in the industry that ASIC had imposed conditions on the licence of Australian Financial Services in 2011 as a result of misconduct by its advisors. I'm sorry, I just can't answer that question. I don't know if that was well known in the industry or not. I'm sorry? I, I can't answer that question. I don't know if that was known at, at the time or not. Well, I'll just show you for completeness a media release about that action, uh, which is RCD 0021-0001-0398. This is exhibit 2.131. And I'll just direct your attention there to this media release on the 7th of November 2011 about ASIC's action against Australian Financial Services following a six-month surveillance, which resulted in additional conditions being imposed on their licence as a result of the concerns listed in this document. Yes. Yes, I see that. And what I want to put to you is that the fact that Mr Palmer was coming to Genesis in 2013, having been at Australian Financial Services in the period covered by this action um, would have been a matter of concern to Genesis. I, I just don't feel qualified to... I wasn't in the business at that time. Um, for some of this time I was living overseas. I, I, it, if this were well known in the industry, yes, it would have been a concern to Genesis. I just don't feel qualified to answer that question. Yes. You are the person I have to ask, Ms Britt, because AMP has put that. you <laughs> forward to give evidence about Mr that. Palmer. All right, could we go back to the interview assessment document and can I ask you to look at 0053? We'll see that this is the advisor assessment part of the document. Yes. yes. We see there, how long have you been a financial planner? And the reference again to Australian Financial Services. Yes. Uh, we see down the bottom, um, have you completed specialist accreditation with a registered training organisation? Yes, Self-managed super fund, brackets, Australian Financial Services course. Yes. Do you understand Australian Financial <coughs> Services to be a registered training organisation? No, I no, uh, no, I don't understand that. No, thank you. And if we could turn to the next page, 0054, we see um, that Mr Palmer describes his present role at Australian Financial Services as insurance, investments, superannuation, including self-managed superannuation funds, advisor. What is your expected role? Same, consolidating into complete wealth. Do you see further down, do you specialise in a particular area of advice? And the form has been completed to record that he specialises in those aspects of advice recorded above. Could I see just see the rest of that document? The rest of the page? Oh, yes. yes, thank you. Yes, I see that. Uh, and you see all of the strategies and products, yes. including restricted strategies and restricted products yes. that it's indicated that Mr Palmer will be involved with. Yes. And 
in answer to the question, considering the issues raised, are there training needs that should be addressed in the induction training? Yes. What is recorded is none urgent advice process course recommended. Yes. Can I then take you to um, 0055, the following page, and we see that um, Mr Hillis has recorded that Mr Palmer has been the subject of a complaint in 2009 yes. and yes, 10 relating to 10% of a portfolio being in basis capital and that the complaint was settled in 2012. Yes. And we see further down that it went to FOS, then settled via remediation. Yes. And a yes, professional yes. indemnity claim was lodged and Mr Palmer paid the excess. Yes, I see that. And then finally, on the last page, 0056, we see that uh, the person completing this form is to obtain and attach a copy of the advisor's previous audit report less than 12 months old. Yes. And then summarise the findings as follows, with the date of audit and the audit rating achieved. Yes. And what Mr Hillis has written is six monthly with previous Australian Financial Services licensee, which is Australian Financial Services Limited, audit rating not provided to advisor, email with minor points for action may be available. Yes, I see that. In your experience, would it be unusual for an advisor not to be provided with an audit rating following an audit? Yes, based, yes, based on my experience, yes. So this should have been cause for alarm as well? Yeah, yes. But we see, if we go back to the first page, the recommendation made by Mr Hillis about Mr Palmer. Yes. <coughs> Down the bottom of the page, the following aspects are noted. ADFS not held at this point. What do you understand ADFS to be? I'm sorry, I'm not sure. It's advanced diploma of financial, financial services. services. So that appears to relate to yes. his qualifications. Yes, sorry, yes, yes. Uh, and the fact that he does not hold an advanced diploma of financial services. Future ready requirements have been discussed with the advisor. Yes. Number two, past advice has included agribusiness, property funds now frozen, and exposure to basis capital. Yes. Number three, past complaint by one was resolved by FOS re remediation in late 2011 with PII excess paid. Yes. None of these issues is expected to prove prohibitive to appointment, and I recommend that the advisor proceed to application stage. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. FA and advice assessment, re Palmer, 10 December 2012, AMP 6000-0053-0051, exhibit 2.165. That was December 2012. Yes. Brit. Yes. And a short time later, Mr Palmer completed an authorised representative application form, which yes, I'll correct. show you in yes. January 2013. Uh, that document is... Um, AMP 6000-0053-0101. If we turn to the second page, perhaps we could have the second and the third pages on the screen. You'll see that this relates to Mr Palmer. Yes. And on... The right-hand side, section two, the question in the application form is, which areas of advice do you wish to appear on your financial services guide? Yes. Uh, and we see that Mr Palmer has ticked every strategy and every product. Yes. Except agribusiness. Correct. Uh, including self-managed super funds. Correct. And there is a notation next to self-managed super funds. Do you see the asterisk there? Yeah, we, we might need to... I'm sorry, no, I don't. Oh, yes, might I need do. to zoom in on self-managed super funds. You'll see an asterisk. Yes. And then the asterisk says, relevant specialist qualifications must accompany your application yes, for I these see that. areas of advice. Yes. 
Did Mr Palmer provide any specialist qualifications for self-managed superannuation funds advice? Not that I have seen in the documents. Well, he didn't have any, did he, Ms Britt? It, no, it doesn't appear he did. Mm -hmm. And then in section three, advisor and employment history, the question that Mr Palmer is asked to address is, do you currently hold an authority to act as an authorised representative? Yes. And we see that he did. Yes. The licensee was Australian Financial Services. Yes. You've been with them since 2003. Yes. In answer to the question, do you have clients to transfer to Genesis? Yes. We see that he has ticked yes. And yes. he's provided approximate values uh, attributable to his client base. Risk, is that insurance? Yes. Of 150? <coughs> yes. What do you interpret that to be, 150? Um, I, I don't know whether it's referring to the values of policies that, that his clients have got. And we then see a reference to FUM, which is funds under management. management. Yes. He had $30 million worth of Correct. funds under management. Correct. And a turnover. Do you, can you read what is after turnover there? Um, it looks to me like 650k, but yes, 650,000 dollars. Yes. So Mr. Palmer had a significant and valuable client base that he was willing to transfer to Genesis. It appears so. Yes. Yes. And then, if we turn to 0105, we see his response to the question in section six: Do you have industry qualifications? Yes. Yes, but nothing is listed in financial planning industry qualifications. Just an advanced diploma in applied science under other tertiary qualifications. Yes, sorry, I see that, yes. And could I ask you then to look at 0107, section 8, and we see the areas of advice uh, ticked by Mr Palmer. Yes. These are all the things he is going to do, insurance, business insurance, uh, corporate superannuation, estate planning. Yes. These are all ticked by him on the basis that these are areas in which he ad is advising on under authority. Yes. Uh, and at 0108, as that section continues, we see that Mr Palmer has ticked that he is advising under authority in relation to self-managed superannuation funds. Do you see that towards... As, uh, yes, I can see that, yes. And also in relation to direct property? Yes. And also in relation to gearing? Yes. Tender that document, Commissioner. Our authorised representative application by Palmer, AMP 6000-0053-0101 is Exhibit 2.166. So having been through the interview process in December 2012 yes. and having completed this application form in January 2013, Mr Palmer, through his corporate entity, was appointed an authorised representative of Genesis? Yes, he was. And Mr. Well, sorry, I'm not. I'm not sure it was his corporate entity in the first instance, but it, I think he, it subsequent. He subsequent. I think he was with yep. a different member firm, and then it became later. It was his corporate entity. Is my memory? Yes. So through through an entity uh, yes, of yes. some sort that's initially. That's correct. Yes. yes, that's correct. And uh, Mr. Palmer and Genesis executed various documents to give effect to that authorised representative arrangement. Correct. And the effect of those documents was that Mr. Palmer's remuneration was determined by reference to the income that he brought into Genesis from product issuers and from the fee income he brought into Genesis. Yes. Thank you. Um, was the assessment of Mr Palmer that was done prior to him being appointed as an authorised representative of Genesis adequate? No. Well, based, based on the documents I've seen, it, it appears that it was 
a deficient process. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you to look at AMP 6000053012? Uh, yes. This is an email dated 22 July 2014 attaching an issue notification form which is at 0013. Yes. And we see there towards the bottom of the page that on the 18th of July 2014, this is over a year after Mr, Mr. Palmer has commenced as an authorised representative with Genesis. Yes. The view is expressed in this issue notification form that the appropriate training and induction had not taken place and the assessment made by Peter Hillis should have been more thorough. Yes. It was inadequate, wasn't it, Ms Britt, to accept Mr Palmer's training in self-managed superannuation fund advice when it didn't come from a registered training organisation? Yes. Uh, particularly where the advice assessment document indicated that he intended to continue providing self-managed superannuation yes. fund advice. Yes. It was inadequate, wasn't it, to take Mr Palmer on his word that he didn't know what his last audit rating was? Yes, it was. And it was inadequate to not exercise greater care in circumstances where Mr Palmer was coming from Australian Financial Services Limited? Yes. Uh, and in circumstances where he was coming with a previous complaint that had been resolved by FOS remediation? Yes, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think the fact that an advisor has one complaint is, is necessarily, uh, but I would agree with the first three propositions, certainly, and in relation to the complaint generally, we would investigate that further. What about the complaint in the context of all the other matters in that the, I've listed? In the context group? of everything else, yes. Yes. Thank you. I, I would accept that it was a deficient process. Thank you. Commissioner, could I tender the email attaching the issue notification form? Email and issue notification form July 2014 AMP 6000 0053 0012 exhibit 2.167. Ms Britt, the requirement that we saw in the earlier documents for an assessment of three client files to be done during the interview or yes. soon after joining wasn't adhered to for Mr Palmer, was it? I haven't seen evidence that it was. Mr Palmer didn't submit anything for assessment until February 2014, approximately 10 months after he had, he had commenced working as an authorised representative of Genesis, did he? Not that I have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, could I ask you to um, turn to tab 38 of your statement, which is AMP 6000-0037-2351? Yes. This is a memorandum that you've annexed from Tim Steele, the Managing Director of Genesis and IPAC regarding Mr Palmer. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I think, I think it's too Tim I'm still. sorry, my, yeah. my mistake, you're right, yeah. Ms Brute. It's from Claudia Fermanges. Fermanges, yes. Fermanges? Yep, yes. Uh, two people, including Mr Steele. That's correct, yes. Regarding Mr Palmer on the 20th of August 2014. Yes. And we see um, a reference there on the following page, 2352, at the top of the page. Yes. To Mr Palmer sending through five statements of advice to AMP vetting on the 7th of February 2014. Correct. And nothing had previously been provided to vetting for approval. Yes, I see that. And the statements of advice we see were dated May 13, August 13, October 13 and two from November 13. Yes. Uh, and they contain, contain various advice strategies. Yes. And we see below the table that AMP Vetting emailed Mr Palmer on the 11th of February 2014 requesting fact finds to be submitted because all that he'd given you was the statements of that's advice. That's correct, yes, that's correct. Um, so AMP Vetting asked for the fact finds so that the advice could be vetted and Mr Palmer didn't provide those. That's correct. And there was no follow-up by AMP Vetting? <laughs> I... Uh there is, there is certainly a policy whereby that should have occurred. I haven't seen 
in this particular case where it was followed up by vetting. There's no evidence that it did There's no evidence. There. That's correct. Mm -hmm. In fact, not one of Mr Palmer's files was reviewed until July 2014, more than a year after he had commenced as an authorised representative. Uh, and the only reason that occurred in July 2014 uh, was because Mr Palmer made a, tr a decision to transition from providing advice as part of one member firm to a single advisor firm. That's correct, yes. That appears to be correct. Yes. Uh, you haven't annexed any documents to your statement connected with that review that happened in connection with that transition, but I want to show you some of them. Uh, can I ask that you be shown AMP 6000053047? Now, this is an email chain from July 2014. And if we start at 0048, we see an email from, perhaps if we could have both pages on the screen, we see an email from Bronwyn Carter at AMP to Learning, Yes. another part of AMP. Yes. Um, hi Liz, as discussed, I'm in the process of reviewing an FSG, a financial services guide for a Genesis advisor, Adam Palmer. Now that review would have been in the context of his um, decision to transition from a member firm to a single advisor firm, which it would have necessitated, necessitated changes to his financial services guide. Uh, I would assume so, given the dates, yes. And part of the process for this is to look at AEE. That's an internal AMP system of some sort, is it? Yes. Yes. To and I'm afraid I've forgotten what the acronym is. That, that's yes. all right. To confirm the advisor has the relevant qualifications and accreditation to support the areas advice, of advice that the FSG discloses in the advisor profile. For this particular advisor, his profile in the internal system is listed as prospective. Yes. He has been appointed according to the ASIC register and has an active Salesforce account. There are also a number of accreditation areas that seem to be missing, such as North Guarantee, Margin Lending and Self-Managed Superannuation Funds. I will be informing Adam Palmer that his records need to be updated to address a number of the accreditation areas <coughs> prior to providing the FSG to clients. Would you please look into why the internal record for this particular advisor is still showing as prospective? Now, prospective was some sort of record in the system that indicated that the person was to become an advisor but had Correct. not yet Correct. commenced operating as an advisor. Correct. Uh, and this is July 2014, more than a year after Mr Palmer has been acting as an advisor Correct. on the behalf of Genesis. Correct. And if we look at the response to that email later that day, um, we see that... Uh, um, <coughs> Elisabetta, a systems consultant, responds to Ms Carter and explains that there is no record of, Ms. of Mr Palmer having completed either an external self-managed superannuation fund accreditation or the in-house introduction to SMSF's training. Yes. And the next paragraph down, until the supporting documentation has been provided, he can't provide advice in self-managed superannuation funds. Yes, I see that. Yes. And she also explains that she's updated his role on the internal systems to comprehensive, so it no longer reflects prospective. Yes. Um, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Emails of July 2014 between Carter Learning and others concerning Palmer AMP 6000053047, Exhibit 2.168. Were any steps taken at this time to prevent Mr Palmer from providing self-managed superannuation fund advice? Uh, I, I haven't seen anything in the documents. There's no evidence to suggest that any step was taken to prevent him from providing that advice, is there? I, I don't believe I've seen any evidence. Now, as part of this review, that was um, triggered by his transition between firms, further issues with Mr Palmer emerged, didn't they? Yes. 
Um, and if we could go to AMP 6000 and if we could bring up 0100 on the other side of the page, this is an email attaching a second issue notification form. Yes. Dated the 20. Uh, the email is dated the 22nd of July 2014, and the issue notification form dated the 18th of July. Yes. And we see that the issue that's identified in this form. Uh, is that upon the review of his financial services guide and subsequent discussions, it was discovered that Adam Palmer has an interest in a property advocacy business called Property Saint, which has not been disclosed or approved by the licensee. Yes, I see that, yes. Has the issue been rectified? No. And then further down, please provide details of all affected clients I would suggest that all SMSF clients who hold property from the 3rd of May 2013, that's when Mr Palmer commenced, yes. would be affected. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Email and issue notification form 18 July 14, re Palmer AMP 6000 0053 0099, exhibit 2.169. That wasn't the end of the issues identified in this review. Uh, there were also issues identified with failures by Mr Palmer to adhere to the best interest duty in the provision of advice. That's right, yes. Uh, and as a result of all of these concerns, a decision was made to subject Mr Palmer to an audit. Correct. For the first time? Uh, yes, that was the first audit, yes. On the 23rd of July 2014? Yes. And you've exhibited the audit report to your statement at tab 25, capital A, which is AMP 6000-0028-0841. And we see there that the result of this first audit conducted for Mr Palmer was an E rating. Yes, that's right. And as I think you've already said, that's the lowest possible rating right. in an yes. audit. Yes, and that's right. An E rating is given where six or more high risk issues that's correct. with yes. material impact correct. Yes. are identified. Yes. And we see from this um, letter to Mr Palmer that he's told he has failed to meet minimum standards required when providing advice and that serious deficiencies have been identified which require immediate and focused attention. Yes. You've read this audit report, Ms Britt? Yes, I have. So you would know that within the five files that were reviewed, there were 27 high risk issues identified, 55 medium risk issues identified yes. and 11 low risk issues identified. Yes. Uh, could I ask you to look at 0843? Within um, the files reviewed, there was a particular file which is dealt with on this page. This was for a couple who were wanting to renovate their home, yes. establish a self-managed superannuation fund, yes. roll over their super into the self-managed fund and purchase an investment property. Yes. And the audit identified a raft of problems with the advice given to this couple. Yes. And these are dealt with over the following pages, 0843 through to 0845. Yes. Perhaps if we could have 0844 and 0845 on the screen. Um, the problems that were identified with the advice that this couple received included there being no evidence of their risk tolerance being assessed. Correct. The advice fell outside the scope of Mr Palmer's accreditations. Correct. Because he didn't have self-managed superannuation right. fund or gearing accreditations. That's right. And he was also providing advice that could be deemed as property advice. Yes, that's correct. All right. And if we turn to 0848, you'll see the heading further investigation, brackets scoring impact. Yes. 
And this is where we see that Adam has a direct interest, 60% ownership in a property business, Property Saint. Yes. All SMSF LRBA clients are referred to an eddy in this business who is a buyer's advocate or agent and he sources the property on behalf of the clients or trustees. Yes. And as a result of the above, I could not determine in any of the files reviewed that the clients legitimately sought advice on buying property in a self-managed superannuation fund. Yes. The files do not demonstrate that the advisor has either adequately disclosed this conflict of interest, documented any fees received from the property business or pro profit split, or adequately managed the conflict of interest by placing the client's interests ahead of his. Yes. The provision of advice in circumstances where the advisor has an undisclosed or insufficiently disclosed conflict of interest is a very serious matter, isn't it, Ms Britt? It is, yes. Um, advice of that nature is tainted, isn't it? Because it may not have been given in the client's best interest, but to advance the interest of the advisor. Yes, that's certainly the risk, yes. And if we continue in this document to point four, we see that the knowledge of the advisor with respect to SMSF and SIS legislation is questionable. Yes. One file that was not reviewed in this audit due to advice being provided under the authorisation of Australian Financial Services, the previous licensee, yes. showed email communication between the advisor and clients regarding architect reports and demolition works to a dentistry property held in the self-managed super fund. The advisor had commented that the self-managed super fund could pay for these two bills. When I raised that capital improvements were not allowed for property held in self-managed super funds with borrowing, the advisor seemed genuinely surprised. Yes, I see that. So uh, that finding demonstrates, doesn't it, Ms Britt, what could have happened if Genesis had followed um, adequate procedures and reviewed files of Mr Palmer before or immediately after he was authorised as a representative of Genesis. Yes, I, I accept that's true. It's an example of a file that, had it been reviewed at that time, would have rung alarm bells. Yes, I imagine, yes. And this audit identified that Mr Palmer had engaged in similar conduct in respect of nine other clients? Yes, that's correct. Do you accept that Mr Palmer's conduct was dishonest? I, I did consider this long and hard because I know it was one of the questions asked. My, um, my, my response at the time was based on the fact there was no evidence of actual dishonesty. But I accept what are you referring to when you're referring to your response at the time, Ms Britt? Well, sorry, the response I provided as part of my statement yes. um, was, was based on the fact I hadn't seen any evidence of actual dishonesty, but I accept, obviously, that it's a matter of grave concern um, that the advisor hasn't, um, hasn't disclosed um, his interest in this property business. And... Um, and I'm, I'm aware that, that um, I mean, I was, I was basing my opinion on the document review that I undertook. Um, I know that when we subsequently did report this advisor to ASIC as an SCC, I've seen that we did, I think, um, when we broadly categorised his conduct, I think we did use the word possibly did use the word dishonest when we when we made that notification subsequently. Do you accept that it was dishonest? I, I, I accept that it could be interpreted yes. as dishonest. I are, accept that. Are you aware that AMP in its um, submission to the Commissioner in response to the Commissioner's uh, letters about misconduct um, described the conduct of Adam Palmer as dishonest or illegal conduct? Um, yes, so I... I think that was, as I said, based on how we categorised it when we reported him as an SEC to ASIC, and I think that was the basis on which we provided that information to the Commission. And was that characterisation for the purposes of the report to ASIC correct? Well, I think that report was made by people who were um, 
who were intimately involved with the matter. So I would accept, if that is the categorisation they made, I made an assessment based on what I had seen, on the documents that I had reviewed. So following this audit, in July 2014, the matter went to the AMP issues panel? Correct. And there was a decision made by AMP to terminate Mr Palmer's authority? That's correct. But Mr Palmer resigned before he was terminated? Correct. Um, could I ask you to look at AMP 6000290892? It's tab 27 to your statement, um, Ms Britt. Yes. Yes. Um, this is an email chain on the 24th and 25th of December, uh, I'm sorry, of September 2014. Yes. Could I ask you to start at 0895? We see there an email sent by Mr Palmer to yes. AMP on the 25th of September 2014. Yes. Hi Grant and Sharon, we have made the decision to move across to another dealership which better suits our requirements would like this to be effective of 24th October 2014, we are moving to Dover Financial Advisors. Yes, I see that. Um, could you please send transfer deed as well as draft copy of letter that needs to be sent to our clients? It's just at the bottom of page four of oh, that. Oh, sorry, yes, change. I see that, yes. yes. And that resignation was accepted by AMP? Yes. And Mr Palmer's authorisation was terminated with immediate effect? Yes. There was then some internal discussion at AMP, wasn't there, about what to tell Dover Financial Advisors? Yes, I've seen that. Uh, so if we return to the email chain and go to 0892, and if we could have 0892 and 0893 on the screen, we'll see that on the 25th of September, Mr Fogarty of AMP um, said to Sharon Zodzanov of AMP, uh, hi Sharon, as per Claudia's email, we will still be writing to his clients. We want copies of his files and we are happy for him to go immediately over the page. Yes. Can I also ask that if Dover, new licensee call to ask for a reference check that we don't provide any information, please. Yes, I can see that. Uh, and then um, Ms Vermanja responds to this email, also on 0892. Yes. She was one of the people copied on the original email. Yes. And she tells Mr Scott, I can change the termination letter slightly to accommodate this. Please let me know once we speak to Adam. Re-reference requests from Dover we still have an obligation to provide factual information to Dover. Dover is a small licensee who took on board another charter advisor we terminated in July this year, and they didn't ask for any references. If anyone from Dover asks for a reference, please ask them to put their questions in writing and forward their request to me. Yes, I've seen that. Um, did Dover ask for a reference in relation to Mr Palmer? So I'm, I'm not aware of whether they did, and, and in the searches that we did, um, prior to me completing my statement, we were unable to locate any, any documents. So I, I can't say whether or not they did, only that we haven't been able to locate any. You found, I haven't seen you any. found no reference to I any, haven't seen any request by Dover for information no. about Mr Palmer? I haven't seen any. Did Charter reach out to Dover uh, to let them know that it had decided to terminate Mr Palmer as an authorised representative and why it had made that decision? Um, I, I'm sorry, I said Charter. I should have said Genesis. Genesis. I'm sorry. Um, no, that's all right. Um, I understood the question. Um, I, I've seen nothing to indicate that 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 happened. And if that did not happen, which appears to be the case, why didn't it happen? So my understanding is that it, the process is that, that we uh, wait for a reference check from the new licensee. And, and once they are contacted, once we are contacted by the new licensee, then we would hand that information over does that remain the policy today, that you wait for a reference check from the licensee? 
Well, I mean, things are, are slightly different now with the ABA protocol. Um, and I think as an industry, we're much more careful about reference checking with advisors. So um, I would anticipate that we would receive a, a request through that process and, and we then respond accordingly. There's a, 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 pro form, a template form that would be submitted and we would provide that information in response. And what if you don't receive such a request? Is the practice today to reach out to licensees that you know your terminated advisors are going to, to explain the basis for the termination? Um, so in most cases, we won't actually be aware necessarily where they're going, which licensee they're going to. Let's restrict it to situations like this where you are aware. So I'm not, I'm not aware that we reach out proactively and provide that information, but we certainly do um, provide details when the reference checking process is, is invoked. Do you think you should proactively reach out to other licensees to provide that information, Ms Britt, um, given that there is a basis for a concern that this terminated advisor will engage in the same sort of conduct towards other clients in the future? I think, I think our experience is now that, that incoming licensees would would always undertake those that reference checking. And so as an industry, we're now alive to these issues and we're alive to the risk of, um, of non-compliant advisors sort of bouncing around the industry. And so there is, there is this a, a protocol and, and a dialogue in place between licensees to, to try to prevent this happening. Mm. So that's as a result of the ABA reference checking protocol, but that wasn't the situation before that time? That's correct, mm -hmm. yes. And are you aware that after Mr Palmer moved to Dover, ASIC conducted a review of his files at Dover and identified multiple potential breaches of the Corporations Act in connection with his files? So I'm aware that after he left AMP, after he left Genesis, we uh, reported him to ASIC mm -hmm. and, and I'm aware that on the um, I'm assuming, sorry, that it was off the back of that notification. We received some ASIC notices, which we responded to, and we handed over client files in response to those notices. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware that ASIC reviewed those files, and, and I did receive some correspondence from ASIC um, off the back of that review. I hope that answered your question, sorry. Well, I, I was interested in whether you were aware that after he went to Dover, ASIC conducted a review of his files at Dover and found uh, multiple breaches of the Corporations Act in those files. No, I think I was talking about the Section 33 notice from ASIC, which was files in which he provided advice while he was still under the Genesis licence. Um. The breach assessment that you're, uh, you've mentioned, yes. in October 2014, that breach assessment was done within AMP. This is an assessment of whether or not to report this as a breach to ASIC. Yes. Uh, and a decision was made in that breach assessment that the breach was not significant and reportable, yes. um, albeit there was a suggestion that details of the advisor should be provided to ASIC. That's correct, yes. Um, you accept, don't you, that Mr Palmer's conduct demonstrated significant compliance issues? Yes. And was the decision not to report Mr Palmer's conduct to ASIC at that time the correct decision? So I think there's, again, there's two separate things. I think the decision not to report it as a licensee breach, based on what I've seen was a correct decision. The decision separately not to report Mr Palmer as an SCC, I think I've said in my statement that that's, that's not a decision that I would take today based on everything I have seen. It, he falls within, fairly squarely within the SCC category. And I note that subsequently we did report him as an SCC. So in relation to that decision, I, I would, I would question whether that was the right decision. Mm. So that was the decision in October 2014, not to refer him to ASIC on the basis of a serious compliance concern. 
Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure we're talking about the right decision. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was the 6th of November when we... No, I'm, I haven't come to that yet. There's a, a, an assessment done on the 7th of October 2014, and if you have a look at tab 30 of your statement... Yes. ..you'll see a document you've annexed about that. Yes, so that... That is in relation to a potential licensee breach, not the decision to report him as an SCC advisor. So the decision that you um, uh, say would lead to a different approach today yes. in your statement, which you're referring to in 39G of your statement, is the decision made in November 2014, is that's, that right? That's correct. And that's the decision um, not to report uh, uh, Mr Palmer's conduct that's to correct. ASIC, not a licensee breach, but that's correct. his so, conduct. That's correct. I so understand. The, yeah, the decision, the breach assessment decision, which you've taken me to at tab 30, Yes. I'm comfortable based on what I've seen that that was, that was the right decision. Yes. Um, the, the decision in November not to report him personally um, I, I, I'm not comfortable that that actually was the right decision and, and based on what I've seen um, today, we would, we, would, um, we would be reporting him as a serious compliance concern and indeed we, we did, some time later we did. Well, um, you didn't tell ASIC anything about Mr Palmer's conduct until about nine months later uh, on the, in July 2015 uh, when AMP named Mr Palmer in response to a request for information from ASIC yes, that's um, correct. about advisors that Genesis had identified serious compliance that's concerns for. That's correct. So when you say that there was a notification, there was an answer to a request by ASIC for information, is I'm that sorry, right? I'm sorry, yes, I didn't mean to mislead you. Yes, it was in response to an ASIC notice, we told them about Mr Palmer mm -hmm. at that stage. And yes, it was July 2015, mm -hmm. yes. In your statement, you explain the reasons why you think Mr Palmer provided inappropriate advice, and you say that the principal reason was his lack of understanding of his legal and policy obligations, Yes. specifically as they related to the best interest duty and related um, obligations. Yes. But Mr Palmer didn't receive adequate training after he started with Genesis, did he? No, he didn't. Um, he never received best interest training, no, did he? No, he didn't. Um, and that was because he had been entered in the system as a prospective advisor um, right. rather than an advisor and therefore no one ever followed up the need for him to receive best interest duty training. That's correct, yes. So that was a failing on the part of Genesis, was it not? It was. And the process for conducting due diligence on Mr Palmer when he joined uh, Genesis also failed? Yes, I accept that seems to be the case. And Genesis also failed to ensure that Mr Palmer was only providing advice within areas in which he was accredited to provide advice? Yes. Uh, and yet you tell us in your statement that Genesis has made no changes to its practices and procedures as a result of the events involving Mr Palmer. Well, again, I think I was, I was seeking to answer that very specifically that um, there has been a lot of changes in our onboarding policy, a lot of changes in our reference checking policy. We now have a, a very robust harmonised policy in that regard. Um, what, I, what I was specifically saying is that this particular case did not trigger that. Nonetheless, we now have a very robust reference checking policy um, whereby I'm, I'm satisfied this wouldn't, this wouldn't occur. Uh, and sorry, if I can also add, um, you know, we no longer have Genesis as a licensee. After the decision was made in November 2014 not to report um, Mr Palmer's conduct to yes. uh, ASIC, there was a meeting about potential remediation of Mr Palmer's clients? Yes, there was. Uh, and um, could I ask you to look at your tab 32, which is AMP 6000372085? Yes. And this is a, a letter that was to be sent to clients of Mr Palmer's. Yes. Um, it's 
a letter that was to go to the, the very clients that received the advice that I raised with you earlier, the couple who wanted to establish the self-managed yes. super fund to buy an investment property. And um, by this letter, Genesis offered them a free advice review. Yes. But Genesis didn't offer them any remediation. I, I think the intention was to review that advice to see whether or not they should be remediated. And how does the client know that that is the intention, Ms Britt? Um, I think it is intended by words such as it is imperative that the, your situation is reviewed so we can ensure that you've received appropriate advice. Mm -hmm. But I accept that nowhere in this letter is it spelt out that you may be entitled to compensation. No. Um, Genesis became aware that Mr Palmer had provided inappropriate advice that potentially required customer remediation in July 2014, nearly four years ago. That's correct, yes. And Genesis terminated Mr Palmer's status as an authorised representative in September 2014, about three and a half years ago. Correct, yes. Has any client of Mr Palmer's received any remediation for the receipt of inappropriate advice from Mr Palmer? No, not as far as I'm aware. And a number of files of Mr Palmer's clients are yet to be reviewed? That's correct. When will AMP conclude its assessment of those files? I, I don't have a, a, a date for when that will be complete. And do you know by when AMP will have determined whether to um, make any offer of remediation? No, I don't. And has AMP made any specific provision for compensation for any of Mr Palmer's clients? Uh, no, I'm advised we haven't specifically provisioned in relation to this advisor. Uh, so, Ms Britt, each of the three advisors that I've asked you questions about uh, failed audits, didn't they? Correct. And do you agree that the file audit process is a critical part of AMP's monitoring of its advisors? Yes, I would accept that. Um, file audits are the principal method of ensuring that appropriate advice is being given by AMP's authorised representatives? Um, yeah, yes, there are other methods, you know, such as mandatory power planning, mandatory vetting, but I would accept that that um, auditing plays a critical role. Mm -hmm. And in November last year, PwC conducted a review of AMP's advice control framework. Uh, yes, correct. Could I ask that you be shown AMP 6000006 This is not an annexure to your statement, uh, Ms Britt. Right, so uh, are you familiar with this document, Ms Britt? I've, se I've seen this document, yes. So it's a um, PwC um, document, perhaps we could pan out so we can see the bottom of the document, a PwC document um, dated November 2017, um, containing a piece of work done by P PwC about your advice control framework operational effectiveness. And it follows an earlier review of the advice control framework that was conducted by PwC in 2015. That's correct, yes. But this is the most recent comprehensive review. Yes. Uh, so if we turn to uh, 5032 and 5033, if we could have both of them on the page at the same time, we'll see that It's 
5032 and we'll just bring up 5033. Um, the review identified two high priority areas for improvement. And we see that from the table on the left hand side, those two matters uh, 3.1 and 3.2. Yes. Um, and uh, from the page to the right, we see that 3.1 and 3.2 related to file audits and yes. vetting. Yes. And could we go to the findings about file audits at 5047? We see there the findings of PwC in relation to file audits, which is identified as a high importance issue with a gap. Yes. And the priority is a colour, which we don't see on this, cop uh, this copy, but it um, aligns with the high uh, risk colour in the table we just looked at. Yes. And we see that. PwC re-performed a sample of file audits which focused on risk-based attributes and identified a number of potential issues. They included that in three of 12 audit cases selected, the auditor awarded the advisor a result that was inconsistent with the outcome we reached. And there is then a reference to three key types of discrepancies. Yes. In one case, we scored a D rating uh, where the ASC, that's the auditor, is it? Yes, it is. Scored an A rating. In one case, we scored an A result down to a C result. Uh, in one case, we scored a C result down to a D rating. Uh, the scoring method should be enhanced for the following. The approach remains very sensitive and the difference between A, B and C can be quite subjective. For example, an audit of four files that has a specific medium risk issue occurring within all files. Um, deciding whether this issue is material or immaterial will determine whether the advisor receives an audit rating of A or C. In other words, a small discrepancy in interpretation can lead to a vastly different audit outcome. Now, this is what we saw in relation um, to Mr E's C audit. Isn't it, Ms. Yeah, Britt? Yes, that's right, and that was I had expressed my discomfort. Yes, and PwC expresses their uh, concern about this as well. Yes, um, and we see that the omission of a fee, the omission of a fee disclosure statement, is classified as a medium risk issue, as it is a regulatory requirement that a fee disclosure service is provided to the customer. This should be classified as a high risk issue. Yes, I see that. And under the heading implication, PwC tells us that the file audit process is critical to AMP's monitoring activity and if its consistency and quality varies, then it has the potential to undermine a significant portion of AMP's monitoring and supervision activity. And there are then a series of recommendations made by PwC in response. Yes. Uh, there are six recommendations there. Have each of those recommendations been implemented? So as, as I mentioned, we have, uh, AMP has undertaken a, um, a process of reviewing its entire audit uh, and vetting process. Um, and we have out outsourced some of that. Um, we're doing it in conjunction with discussions we're having with ASIC in relation to Report 515. So it is something that we are absolutely aware of, absolutely working towards, and and have a fairly robust time frame for for achieving. So I can't um, categorically say that we have implemented each one of these recommendations, but what I can say is that Audit 2.0, which is the program, the new audit program, um, will be considering and picking up each one of those. And when will Audit 2.0, when will that program of works be operational, Ms Britt? Uh, so um, the date that, it, that we're working towards with ASIC is, is middle of the year, and there, there'll then be a process of, of um, QAing the process to ensure its robustness after that. 
That's quality assurance. Sorry, so quality assuring, yes. So you accept that um, in the current audit system, there are significant deficiencies that AMP um, needs to address. So I'm, I'm not sure I'd necessarily concede significant deficiencies. It's certainly an imperfect system and it's certainly something that um, it is critical to our overall monitoring and supervision. We, we absolutely accept that. And so it is something that is constantly evolving and we're constantly looking to improve. Mm. And your external consultant has told you that the need to improve is high and that this is one of the two high rated risk issues resulting from their review of your advice control framework. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I won't tender that document, Commissioner. It's annexed to another statement that I will tender shortly. I have no further questions for the witness. Does any party other than AMP seek leave to cross-examine Ms Britt? Very well. Mr Hollow. Thank you. Uh, Ms Britt, you were asked um, some questions concerning uh, recruitment and the checking process of Genesis in 2012. Yes. Can I ask you, has AMP changed its process to recruitment, recruitment and reference checking since 2012? It, yes, it has. It, yes, it has. Um, and it has signed the Australian Bankers Association reference checking and information sharing protocol, is yes, that correct? Yes, it has. Do you know when it did so? Um, September 2016, my understanding is we were the first organisation to do so, but it came into effect, I believe, March 2017. Thank you. Uh, could I try to bring up a document? Let's see how this goes. AMP 6000-0041-1849. Miraculous. Um, um, can you identify that document for the Commission? Yes, I can. That, that is the current um, recruitment and reference checking policy um, that is applied across all AMP licensees. And I think you referred to um, this policy in giving your answers to Ms Orr, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So there's th this policy and then there's a, a set of guidelines that sit behind this policy and together they form our uh, reference checking and, and background uh, and recruitment policy. Uh, thank you. Um, you'll see from the face of the document that it's um, uh, referred to as a final draft pending final approval from legal. Are you able to say what the status of this document is today? Yes, so I, I am aware that this, this policy has been rolled out and is in operation and has been um, for a couple of months, uh, not yet, notwithstanding what it says on the, uh, on the first page. I tend to the document. AMP advice, uh, re recruitment background and reference checking policy version 2.0, 25, 11, 17, AMP 6000, 0041, 1849, exhibit 2.170. Um, uh, Ms Britt, still on the topic um, of uh, recruitment and reference checking, do you know what process takes, takes place at AMP when requests are made uh, from entities who are not signatories or um, who have not subscribed to the ABA uh, protocol? Um, y yes, so as I was mentioning, there is a, effectively a template form that, template ABA, ABA form that, that gets submitted, um, and AMP as an organisation has taken the view that whether or not the incoming licensee is, is a subscriber or not, that, that is the information that we will provide to, uh, to the new licensee. Thank you. Um, Mr Commissioner, I have no further questions. Could I add uh, one, one matter, however? Um, there were some questions about um, the PwC 2017 report. Um, towards the end of the examination of Ms Britt, um, um, could I just reserve my position in terms of a tender of a management response? I don't have it at hand. Um, I wasn't expecting, I, anticipating. I don't think I quite follow what you're telling me, Mr yes. Hollow. I'm being a bit slow or slower than normal anyway. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I'm just uh, reserving my position in respect of a, a tender of a further document on that topic, which I do not have at hand at the moment. That's all I'm saying. We'll cross that bridge when Thank the you. timber's cut down and it's built. Mr Hollow, you uh, are rising out of that, Ms Orr. Thank you very much. Ms. Britt, you Thank may you. step down. Uh, Commissioner, um, Ms Britt is the last witness that we will call in the inappropriate advice uh, part of this hearing block, but I have a number of statements that we obtained from other entities in relation to the provision of inappropriate advice that I wish to tender. Yes. Uh, the first of those is a statement from another AMP witness, Mr Anthony Regan, dated the 11th of April 2018. Would the Commissioner like the document IDs for these if statements as well? If you read them well? out, uh, we can uh, then track them with the, as part of the exhibit Thank note. you. The, the doc ID for that one is AMP 6000632957. That will be exhibit 2.171. We also obtained a statement from Marianne Perkovic of CBA dated 13 April 2018, CBA 9000015001. Will be exhibit 2.172. We obtained a statement from Mr. Renato Motta, M O T A, from IOOF, uh, IFL 9999 0001 0038. It will be exhibit 2.173. We obtained two statements from Macquarie, the first of Michelle Weber, dated the 13th of April 2018, uh, MGL 0006-0002-0142. It can be exhibit 2.174. Now, Ms Weber provided a second statement of the same date. The doc ID for that one is MGL 0006-0002-0130. Comes exhibit 2.175. Uh, and we obtained a statement from Mr. Marty Khan, C A R N E of Centrepoint, W I T 0030 0001 0001. That will become exhibit 2.176. The other entity who provided a statement in relation to the provision of inappropriate advice was NAB. That statement was provided by Mr Andrew Hagger and that will be tendered, uh, I assume, when Mr Hagger gives evidence on another topic uh, as our next witness. Yes. Now, do we need to uh, have a changing of the guard at the bar table? We do, I come back uh, shortly before 10 to 4. Thank you, Commissioner.